Oh, come in, come in. Oh, hello, nice to see you. Come in. Ah, uh, long time no see. Uh, we've been away. I think, as I said, last time you dropped around, we were off an amazing sailing expedition from um, from Istanbul, following in the wake of Paul and ending up near near Athens, around sailing across the Aegean. It was fantastic. Anyway, uh, and then I had to go off to Belfast after I got back. So anyway, come in. I thought I'd tell you, or show you, share with you something that's sort of inspired by that voyage. You just actually take a look at the shelf over here. I'm, I was looking up my Yates um, to double check some readings, and I've got here we are. Uh, this is that nice collected Yates I got in the Oxfam shop. It's a helpful reference book. But come over and you'll see why Yeats, Yeats has uh, emerged. So, our journey started in Istanbul, as the modern city is called. But of course it used to have other uh, more perhaps more storied and resonant names, Constantinople, Byzantium, and it was, of course, as Constantinople, it was the sort of second city of the Roman Empire in the east rather than the west, and of course the centre of the empire moved then to the, to the east and under Constantine, hence Constantinople, and it became, of course, the great centre of the Eastern Church, spread all through Asia Minor. Um, so I was very excited by the thought that I was in Byzantium and we saw the Hagia Sophia and even though some of the mosaics were covered up it's now turned into a mosque you could see just through some veils you know the, the glorious mosaic of, of uh, Marius Theotokos God bearer bringing Christ to you uh, so it was an amazing place and um, anyway you may know I I write a column, a back page column for the Church Times here called Poets Corner. And I realised, even on the trip as it were, that I would still have to put in my weekly copy. So I, I wrote a piece called um, Sailing from Byzantium, which uh, I, I'll read to you. But before I do, I should explain the title because Sailing from Byzantium, which was literally what I was doing, emphasis on the word from, was a sort of riff. Now, where did I put that yet? Yeah, it's a riff on a very famous poem of Yeats, um, sailing to Byzantium. And in fact, it's the opening poem of um, his collection, The Tower, which came out in quite you know, late Yeats, 1928, though it's to be followed later by the even more amazing kind of answering book called The Winding Stair. Anyway, it's a rather remarkable poem. I'll read it to you, the Yeats poem, because I'll be riffing on it in the little prose piece. Uh, it's got a, it's full of, as you say, full of quotations. Various lines from this poem have been taken out and used in different ways, and one's even been made the title of a film, the opening sentence of the poem is that is no country for old men. Um, but uh, it's a strange poem and um, in it Yeats expresses his desire for the eternal, is it a desire for the beautiful and permanent and unchanging, if you like, the ideal life of the intellect, which he also recognises as a spiritual life, it's a life somehow in the given patterns of of existence itself, of which perhaps the world is only a shadow. And uh, he associated for various reasons that vision with the vision of, of, of a kind of high Eastern Orthodox um, Christianity expressed in the art of Byzantium and perhaps particularly the art of the Hagia Sophia where we were. Um, and. Uh, it's an amazing poem because it's very disparaging. It's very well, It's disparaging of himself. He refers to himself as a, ma a kind of a coat on a tattered stick, as though he were a scarecrow. He, 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 he deprecates himself and sees himself in comparison with this lucid and golden intellect as a paltry thing. 
which is pretty amazing because by that time he'd actually received the, the Nobel Prize for literature. He was fated everywhere. He'd been made a senator of Ireland. And I think there's something really quite admirable about Yeats's vision of the, the great things, the true eternal things, becoming so luminous in his old age that, you know, his, his own considerable achievements were as nothing, you know, in comparison with what he wanted to contemplate. Anyway, for better or worse, in all its strangeness, here is Yeats's poem, Sailing to Byzantium. He, ne he never made that voyage, of course. He's sailing towards a kind of Byzantium of the mind. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, these those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh or fowl, commend all summer long whatever is begotten, born and dies, caught in that sensual music, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. You see the contrast between the begotten, born, dying life of time and then the monuments of unaging intellect. Caught in that sensual magic, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. And of course no one was a better poet of that sensual magic than Yeats. Next verse. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, Unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages, standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold, and gold enamelling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Wrote that, as I say, in 19... He wrote it in 1927. Um, extraordinary. An aged man is but a paltry thing. And then he, he, he confesses that he's still sick with desire, it's still caught in this world. But he sees in these gold mosaics. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful passage, just before I read you the meditation I wrote. This is quite a useful book, um, Reader's Guide to W.B. Yeats. You should always read the poems themselves first and form your own opinions. But if you want a little background, this is quite useful. So this gives a passage from Yeats's prose book, A Vision, about, um, he says, if I could be given a month of antiquity and leave to spend it where I chose, I would spend it in Byzantium, a little before Justinian opened the Santa Sophia, the Hagia Sophia, and closed the Academy of Plato. Then later on in this passage, he says, I think that in early Byzantium, maybe never before or since in recorded history, religious, aesthetic and practical life were one. That architect and artificers, though not it may be poets, for language had been the instrument of controversy and must have grown abstract, spoke to the multitude and the few alike. The painter, the mosaic worker, the worker in gold and silver, the illuminator of sacred books, were almost impersonal, almost perhaps without the consciousness of individual design, absorbed in their subject matter, and that, and that, the, vision of a, and that the vision of a whole people. They could copy out of old gospel books those pictures that seemed as sacred as the text, and yet weave all into a vast design, the work of many that seemed the work of one, that made building, picture, pattern, metalwork of rail and lamp seem but a single image. And you can see how some of the language of that has found its way into the poem. So that was Yeats sailing to Byzantium in his imagination. So there I was on board ship thinking, oh gosh, I've still got to write my piece for the Church Times. So here's the little piece from Poet's Corner. 
And this one, as you see, is called, uh, well, I called it Sailing from Byzantium. They've written it. Malcolm Geitz set sail from Byzantium in the footsteps of the great apostle. And I finished it with one of my own poems. So I thought you might like to hear it and we'll conclude with that. A summer holiday has brought me and Maggie to Istanbul, a first for both of us. And for me, the city is charged with, informed and made luminous by its earlier names, Constantinople and Byzantium. I felt contrast, but no contradiction, between the spacious immensity of the Hagia Sophia on the one hand and the crowded, bustling mazes of the Grand Bazaar on the other, any more than between the contemplative and the active life, for the one supports the other. No contradiction either, but rather continuity, between the past, with its illustrious names, and the present, with all its political turmoil, its tensions between Eastern and Western views of the world, and between tradition and innovation. For the same tensions were there in earlier periods too, however golden and permanent they seem from this distance in time. We were there to join a ship that would be sailing west, across the Sea of Marmara, through the Dardanelles, the Hellespont that Byron swam, and out into the Aegean to follow in the wake and footsteps of St Paul. Since we would be sailing from Byzantium, my mind was naturally full of echoes of Yeats's great poem, Sailing to Byzantium. Yeats brought to his imaginary voyage his desire to be gathered into the artifice of eternity, to stand for a moment with the sages standing in God's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall. Yeats was only too conscious as he wrote those lines that he was an aged man, a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, and yet he knew that for all that the soul might still on a sudden clap its hands and sing. I write this on board ship, sailing from Byzantium, astonished by the continuities of history, passing through the narrow straits of the Hellespont and the narrow isthmus of our own time, with the legend of Troy on my left, and the tragedy of Gallipoli on my right, and behind me, somewhere up there on the edge of the Black Sea, the present tragedy of the Ukrainian war, another tug between East and West. And yet the man I am really following on this voyage, the great apostle, embraced all those contradictions between time and eternity, East and West, and added more, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, male and female, embraced them all and found them resolved and reconciled, made into a new creation in Christ. Now, sailing in Paul's wake, I revisit some of the paradoxes which his life and witness exhibited and resolved, and which I once gathered into this sonnet. Here's the sonnet, said Paul. An enemy whom God has made a friend, a righteous man discounting righteousness. Last to believe and first for God to send. He found the fountain in the wilderness, thrown to the ground and raised at the same moment. A prisoner who set his captors free. A naked man with love his only garment. A blinded man who helped the world to see. A Jew who had been perfect in the law blesses the flesh of every other race and helps them see what the apostles saw, the glory of the Lord in Jesus' face. Strong in his weakness, joyful in his pains, and bound by love who freed him from his chains. So, piling on the paradoxes there, but that's the way it is with Paul. One should say, actually, Yeats in the end, wrote an answering poem to Sailing uh, uh, to Byzantium, which is the opening poem of The Winding Stair, which is a book that sort of answers the tower, uh, which is his dialogue of self and the soul, where he thinks again and realises he was ha over hasty to dismiss the world of time and being and becoming and, and begetting and birth and death, that that's the world assigned to the poet and eternity will shine through it, but we should love and care for that world too. Um, 
Anyway, uh, lovely to see you again and share with you some of the reflections. I'll tell you more about the trip sometime anyway, but in the meantime, Slancha, and thanks for calling round.